Yes, I, I heard your introduction. Uh, let me just one small correction. I'm no longer with the American University of Beirut. Okay. Um, I think we need to put what happened in context. One, to claim, although the Saudi regime, uh, particularly Mohammed bin Salman, um, and his supporters in, in numerous US and European uh, media venues are claiming that this is for corruption. Um, let, it, let me just throw one figure at you and you tell me if this is corruption. Thus far, he has frozen, that we know of, 1,300 bank accounts, and he has the wealth of all these people that here he's holding in the Ritz-Carlton amounts to more than $33 billion. So if anything is clear, it's that this man, the Saudi Crown Prince, Mohammed bin Salman, is trying very much to consolidate financial power within Saudi Arabia, as well as to consolidate political power. Now, Saad al-Hariri, as you correctly stated, is the Lebanese Prime Minister. He was summoned to Saudi Arabia on Thursday. On Saturday, he read uh, what we all agree is a Saudi statement. Um, so he, he read what, again, the vast majority of Lebanese politicians and pundits and journalists agree was an involuntary resignation letter. He read it, and it was taped and presented to the world via a Saudi television channel, echoed, as you stated, from Riyadh. This is the first time in Lebanon's history that any member of our government has issued resignation while abroad. And so the Lebanese president, the Lebanese speaker of the house, very recently Hassan Nasrallah, secretary general of Hezbollah, as well as the future movement, which is um, Saad al-Hariri's uh, political party, have all called upon Saad al-Hariri to return to Lebanon. The Lebanese uh, president and speaker of the house consider this resignation that was read by Saad al-Hariri to not be effective, to not be effective because they claim it was involuntary. So we, we have the vast majority, with only two or three Lebanese politicians uh, being the exception, but the vast majority of the Lebanese politicians and the Lebanese people in general are calling for the return of our captive Lebanese prime minister still held involuntarily in Saudi Arabia. So Rania, can you tell us uh, please uh, why uh, Saad al-Hariri has been held in Saudi Arabia? What, I mean, what's the purpose? What what are the demands or like what did... Well, there's, 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 yeah, there's, there's, yes, there's, there's two parts to that. Why he's being held and what are the demands? And I consider them to be separate. Um, we know that for the past year, Saad al-Hariri, I mean, Saad al-Hariri has been prime minister for one year and a few days. Um, within a national unity government. Within this time, Saad al-Hariri has fulfilled his objectives as prime minister and met with various political spectrums in Lebanon. He met with President Trump in July of this year and in his meeting with Trump, he was trying to secure what the Saudi government was trying not to secure. Uh, specifically, the Saudi government and this Hamad bin Salman is very much aligned with Trump and Mohammed bin Salman, the Saudi crown prince, has been pushing that Lebanon no longer be a neutral space but be considered a suitable space for uh, battle as Syria and Iraq and Yemen and Libya and numerous other countries in the region are considered battlefields for the regional world powers. Saad al-Hariri, when he met with Trump in July, was trying to keep Lebanon neutral and he was also trying to de-escalate the sanctions that President Trump was trying to impose upon Hezbollah because Saad al-Hariri recognizes that sanctions of this kind actually impact all of Lebanon. Um, furthermore, very recently, Saad al-Hariri met with an Iranian delegation uh, in Lebanon and the Iranian delegation praised Saad al-Hariri and praised his role in government and specifically the Lebanese army in being very successful in vanquishing ISIS when they had been occupying parts of the Lebanese territory. So we see that Saad al-Hariri has not been very loyal to the Saudi regime because the Saudi regime very much wants to push a 100% anti-Hezbollah line and of course they want to push a vehement anti-Iran line. We also need to remember that it is this Saudi regime that has been funding and supporting ISIS in Syria and in Iraq. So it is within this aspect. Now as to the Saudi demands, the Saudi demands, um, all in the name by the way of protecting Lebanese sovereignty, the Saudi demands since uh, Sunday 
have been that they demand that the Lebanese government, and I'm using their words here, cleanse itself from Hezbollah's participation. Now, your listeners need to know that Hezbollah is a legitimate political party in Lebanon. It has ministers, it has members of parliament, it is considered a, a, a necessary part of the national unity government. So the first demand by the Saudi Arabian government is that suddenly our government remove Hezbollah from its legitimate role within the government. Second, that Hezbollah be disarmed of its, um, of its weapons. And again, when we look at Hezbollah's weapons, this is in agreement with the president and the speaker of the house and the members of parliament who have continued to pass decree after decree, stating that these weapons are part of the national resistance movement. So Saudi Arabia is asking for Hezbollah to be isolated, disarmed, and defeated by the Lebanese government in the name of protecting our sovereignty. And in the event that, that our government has not done this, and our government has not done this, Saudi Arabia very recently declared that the Lebanese government is declaring war on Saudi Arabia. So do you, so see, do you see, Iranian, that, uh, I mean, are you, uh, are you, are you telling me that you could, we could see Saudi Arabia bombing uh, uh, Lebanon? Well, okay, uh, before we jump to possibilities, let's just look at what the Saudi regime has specifically stated. The Saudi regime has openly stated that all options are on the table, including non-political options. Okay, all options are on the table. The Saudi government also states that it considers Lebanon itself to have declared war, thereby implying that all of Lebanon would be uh, participating in these non-political options that the Saudi regime would be imposing upon us all. What could those options be? I mean, they could be financial restrictions and a blockade on Lebanon. They could be an alliance with the Israeli military machine because we know for a fact that there is an alliance between the Zionist state of Israel and the Saudi regime. We know that there is a political alliance and we know very much that the Saudi regime is working to encourage Israel to attack Lebanon. Or there could be a military uh, alliance together, Saudi and Israeli military weapons, um, all geared toward Lebanon. So it could be from as little as financial sanctions that would have repercussions on Lebanon's economy to as large as a military war against Lebanon, either through direct Saudi or indirect Saudi. Now, that those are the options. Now, we can evaluate how possible or how likely those options are. Do you expect any kind of uh, international uh, uproar? Uh, for instance, the president of uh, France is in Saudi Arabia. Did he try and attempt to meet Saad al-Hariri? Uh, you know, his father, the late prime minister of Lebanon, who was assassinated in Lebanon, was a very good friend uh, of the French. Any any international body uh, trying to help Lebanon uh, figure out if Saad al-Hariri uh, is a hostage or he's just spending his days in uh, Riyadh? any international yes. relation, uh, uh, reaction, any reaction from the State Department or the U.S. White House? Yes. Um, the Lebanese government has approached the Jordanian, the Egyptian, the French, and the British government for their support. Um, and they have all attempted to um, call for the release of Saad al-Hariri. Very specifically, the, the French um, government did meet with Saad al-Hariri, but not alone. There was in that meeting a member of the Saudi military intelligence. So in no way could we call that a comfortable or voluntary uh, meeting or a confidential meeting between two leaders. Now, um, the Russian government does acknowledge that this man is being held hostage and the Russian government uh, you know, is in alignment with the Lebanese government's position. The German government is claiming that, this, that uh, our prime minister is not being held hostage and that there is no evidence that he's being held hostage, although you know, there is evidence of that fact. Um, the French government have not spoken as clearly as the German government, but they are also uh, claiming that, that Saad al-Hariri is not held hostage. As to the US government, well, we need to understand that President Trump has very close relations with Mohammed bin Salman. The moment, I mean, the first uh, international visit that Trump did when, when he became president was to visit Saudi Arabia. So. I do not expect that President Trump would be condemning these Saudi actions. Quite the contrary, the very day that uh, our Prime Minister was forced to read this statement written to him by the Saudis, the very day that that happened, Trump tweeted that he would hope that Mohammed bin Salman would move um, Aramco and have its, uh, its IPO be in the New York Stock Exchange. 
Trump has also tweeted uh, congratulations to the Saudi regime for what it claims to be these reform activities. So I would not be expecting anything from the Trump administration. As to other elements of the U.S. government, we have heard from the U.S. Foreign Office that they did not have any uh, information um, of, uh, of these actions happening in Saudi Arabia. Um, so at the very least, we can say that the so-called Western international community is divided as to their official positions with regards to our hostage, you know, to our captive uh, prime minister held in Saudi Arabia. If you're just joining us, we're uh, True Talk on WMNF 88.5 FM. You can follow this uh, uh, interview live on Facebook, uh, but uh, we are talking to Rania Masri. She is talking to us from Lebanon. Uh, Rania, the um, uh, secretary of uh, Hezbollah in uh, Lebanon, just finished a speech. I was driving. Could you like tell us what was he saying? And I just want our listeners to know that Lebanon, uh, you know, is made up of so many different uh, uh, political, religious backgrounds, but. Uh, you people, alhamdulillah, unite whenever you are faced by uh, really a foreign intervention or whenever uh, somebody tries to bomb you like Israel did so, so many times, you all are united and it's very, very difficult to get rid of the only maybe uh, 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 possible uh, defense you have, which is uh, the forces of Hezbollah. But can you tell us uh, what was uh, the gist of his speech that he just gave? Uh, well, this is the second speech that Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah, Secretary General of Hezbollah, has made this week. His first speech was on Sunday and his second speech was today. Both those speeches are available for the public on my Facebook page if they want to read word for word in English what uh, Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah actually stated. His speech that, that he ended just uh, 25 minutes ago today, um, basically went through in detail the situation that we have on hand. Um, Sayyid Nasrallah specifically stated that our Prime Minister is held hostage. This is the first time that he speaks so uh, clearly on, the, on this position. He specifically stated that the resignation is unconstitutional and illegitimate and illegal and therefore our, our, the current government it should still function uh, fully. Um, he, co he called that this uh, direct and exceptional intervention by the Saudi government is an insult to each and every Lebanese, regardless of our political position with regards to Saad al-Hariri, because he is our prime minister and he is being held hostage in Saudi Arabia. Um, he further, you know, Nasrallah also responded to these scaremongering tactics that the Saudi regime is doing, because they have really been elevating the political rhetoric against each and every Lebanese with talk of a Saudi bombardment or an Israeli bombardment or, or all of this talk that, that is very scary. You know, your listeners need to understand just how small Lebanon is. We are 13 times smaller than the state of North Carolina, for example. Um, so we, we're dealing with a small country of um, 6 million residents, uh, 4 and a half million citizens. But within this small country, we are also uh, a country that has managed to liberate the South in May 2000, that has managed to successfully defeat ISIS occupation uh, throughout the lands of Lebanon in August 2017. So we also have to put that into consideration. Nasrallah stated in response to these scaremongering techni techniques that um, although it is more dangerous that the Saudi regime um, in addition to their calling for the removal of their citizens from Lebanon, in addition to the Saudis pushing the Gulf states and other countries to pressure Lebanon, in addition to very direct attempts you know, done by the Saudi ministers to inflame Lebanese against each other through their rhetoric. Furthermore, the Saudis have also attempt, attempted to impose a new prime minister on Lebanon under threat. They have also attempted to impose a new leadership of the future movement, which is Saad al-Hariri's political party also under threat. All of these have failed, but in addition to these attempts, um, the Saudi government is also working to encourage Israel to attack Lebanon. And here Nasrallah reminded us that Israeli calculations as to whether or not they will attack Lebanon will be done based on Israeli calculations and not done based on Saudi calculations. Um, in, in general, Nasrallah's talk was uh, calm, measured, very rational, and it was an appeal towards the national unity and national strength, which I have to say has already been the case throughout this week, that we have shown a great deal of national unity in the face of this latest threat against Lebanon led by Saudi Arabia. Rania, is this a, 
a uh, continuation of the proxy war in Syria where you know Hezbollah and Iran and Russia are on one side and on the other side you have uh, Saudi Arabia and some of the other uh, actors. Is that a continuation of that war spilling into now Lebanon and other places? Well, that war had already spilled into Lebanon for a number of years, and it would have spilled further had the Lebanese army and Hezbollah not been strong enough, you know, not, not been able to defeat ISIS. Um, we, we need to remember that Saudi Arabia, in addition to the U.S. administration, both the Obama administration and the Trump administration, let us also remember, that, that these three administrations have been working very strongly to support ISIS, to support ISIS. That ISIS in Syria and in Iraq is not only a manifestation of the Wahhabi doctrine of the Saudi regime, but is also funded and diplomatically supported by the Saudi regime. We understand through released documents that the Saudi plan was to, quote, light up Damascus. In other words, to cause significant damage to Syria's capital and to work for a regime change. We also know that it is the same regime, the Saudi regime, that had been working to um, develop a, a Kurdish separate movement, that particularly a separate Kurdistan in northern Iraq. So we're not dealing with a country, Saudi Arabia, that has only been involved, and I say only very sarcastically, with the massacre and genocide against the Yemenis in Yemen. But we are dealing with a regional power that has led numerous wars. But is this... To ask your question okay. as to the proxy war, um, I would argue that it is because the Saudi plan in Yemen has failed, that the Saudi plan in Iraq has failed, and that the Saudi plan in Syria has failed, that now we see the Saudi plan in Lebanon. So, uh, this, do you, I mean, do you see that because this war and, and, and with Syria and of course with Lebanon because of the sectarian differences that exist in the region, do you see this uh, from a sectarian lens? I mean, is this about, you know, Sunni Shia, um, you know, Saudi versus Iran in the region or what's really behind this? Very much so. Saudi Arabia is, you know, creating this narrative that there are uh, two fronts in the region, either the Iranian front or the Saudi front, but I do believe that Saudi Arabia is trying to create a problem where none exists. We see this through the Saudi war against Yemen, we see this through the Saudi-led boycott of Qatar, um, and we very much see this within this narrative that um, Iran is a threat to the Arab Gulf, whereas Iran is not a threat to the Arab Gulf. There is one main threat in the region, one threat that continues to rain terror on the region and it, its very presence is an existential threat to the region and that is the state of Israel. And so when, and we, I can discuss that at length as to why I say that. As, as for Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia is promoting this narrative that Iran is a threat. So very much so it comes within this narrative that Iran is a threat that Saudi Arabia also now has declared war on Lebanon. Uh, I was reading also uh, that the, on the BBC that it says that Hassan Nasrallah said uh, that uh, Saudi Arabia asked uh, Israel to bomb Lebanon, but it refused. Yes. So you think Israel well, is being wiser about these latest developments in Lebanon? Because they know that uh, Hezbollah is not uh, that uh, simple uh, power to deal with or force to deal with. Well, I mean, there, there's some of the Israeli press that are arguing that Saudi Arabia wants to lead the war in, in Lebanon until the last Israeli soldier. Um, as, as Nasrallah stated on Sunday, and as he stated again today, um, whether or not Israel will launch war on Lebanon is always possible. It is you know, always uh, an option. It is always something that we in Lebanon recognize to, to be a threat. We have to remember that Israeli ministers have, over the past few months, threatened that the next war on Lebanon, the next war, thereby implying that there will be a war, and they threaten that the next war on Lebanon would not only encompass a war against all of the territory in Lebanon, but would also be a war against Syria and a war against the Palestinians in Gaza. So I don't want to diminish this Israeli threat, because it is always present. But at the same time, I do not think that Israel would launch a war against Lebanon solely because the Saudis have asked it to. So whether or not there would be an Israeli war in Lebanon, it would be led by Israeli calculations. Now, we also need to remember that the Israeli war against Lebanon in 2006, the war that lasted 33 days, although it was 
dramatically destructive to Lebanon, and although it did kill approximately 1,200 Lebanese and cause a fourth of the population to be internally displaced during those 34 days, nevertheless, the Israeli military, with all of its power and all of its prowess, failed to achieve any of its military objectives and actually lost a lot within Israel because of that so-called military adventure. And ever since 2006, Israel has not launched another aggressive attack against Lebanon, although we in Lebanon have gotten used to regular Israeli attacks every three years against our country. How has the government been able to stay together and what's the perception of Hezbollah? Obviously in the United States, the United States government considers Hezbollah a terrorist organization. How is Hezbollah seen in Lebanon and how are they seen in the Middle East? You're throwing a lot of questions at me at the same time, and I, I don't know where to start. Um, let me start by saying that Hezbollah is a national resistance movement. Um, and, and to call it a terrorist organization, we also need to uh, have a little history within U.S. policy and remember that Nelson Mandela was also called a terrorist by the United States. Um, so we would be, you know, Hezbollah would be in good company with, with Nelson Mandela, according to the U.S. Uh, logic here. Um, as to how Hezbollah is viewed in the country, let me state very clearly that although there has been clear attempts by the Saudi regime to present the conflict within a Sunni Shia narrative, uh, this has failed. And it has failed because when we look at Syria, and we look at who actually killed who, we need to remember that ISIS, Jabhat al-Nusra, the so-called Free Syrian Army, are predominantly Sunni. I mean, ISIS and Nusra are Sunni, so to speak. And yet the people that they massacred and that they killed were also Sunni. Not only, of course, Shia, Christian, and Druze, but they also attacked and killed Sunni. Um, so th this narrative has, has failed. After their popularity in Lebanon, Yes, most definitely. Hezbollah's involvement in the fight against ISIS and Jabhat al-Nusra um, and the other so-called rebels that were all firmly aligned with Israel has been unpopular among certain segments in Lebanon. Yes, that is the case. However, it did not manifest itself into the kind of sectarian dialogue that, that one would fear. Um, as when you look at the national government in Lebanon, the national unity government, yes, Hezbollah is um, a legitimate political party. It is uh, supported not only by Nabi Birri, the Speaker of the House and the Amal movement, but supported very much by the Free Patriotic Movement and the Lebanese President, General Michel Aoun, who, um, as you're familiar with the Lebanese politics, is a Maronite Christian. Um, so, you know, I could talk at length about internal Lebanese politics, but it's, it's not as, as black and white as it tends to be uh, represented. But what I'm trying to say is that I don't think there's just one simple reason as to why um, Saad al-Hariri was summoned to Saudi Arabia and then forced to read that resignation letter. There, you know, I think there, there's more than one reason on that. Perhaps this forced, you know, forced uh, attempted resignation by the Saudis of, of Saad al-Hariri is also an attempt to inflame tensions against Lebanon as a whole and to use it as an excuse to launch further sanctions and, and to possibly launch further wars against Lebanon. Um, and against Hezbollah, and who knows, possibly against Iran. You know, uh, Rania, for our listeners, they might think that all that is going on in general in the Arab world for the past hundred years, but especially after the Arab Spring, you know, as if uh, we are a bunch of uh, minorities and ethnicities and political parties that are fighting uh, for power, but th this is really consolidating dictatorship in the whole Arab world. Uh, I mean, I don't think there is an exception uh, anywhere. Um, people are fighting uh, uh, the people who want to have uh, more of an Arab Spring like it started. And, you know, the hypocrisy of the Western society, the hypocrisy of the West, not uh, allowing all this uh, to happen. I'm not sure if you agree with me, but Whenever I see any of these developments going on, I feel it's just these people attached to power. They want to consolidate power, and they do not want to share it and have any democratization. Um, do you agree with me? Well, you know, somebody you brought up 100 years. And this year, we marked the 100-year anniversary of the Balfour Declaration. And I think if we're going to talk about what's happening in the region, we have to put it within context of the Balfour Declaration. This is a declaration done by Lord Balfour of England, in which he promised 
um, to the Zionist movement in Europe, a country and a land that did not belong to him, and to give it to a religious community. So it is because of the Balfour Declaration, because of the level of European anti-Semitism, because of the ongoing and ever persistent occupation and colonization within this region, that we have had what we have today. We have, and we cannot look at this region without recognizing that we have the occupation of Palestine that has been ongoing for almost 70 years. So within, when you bring up 100 years, I think in this region we have had 100 years of resistance against occupation, 100 years of resistance against colonization, 100 years of communities in this region, and we are multi-ethnic, and we are multi-religious, and we have a very long history of living side by side, living together as one people of this land, and not in this Western narrative that we are a community of minorities. We are not a community of minorities. We are people of this land that have different ethnicities and different religions, but we're all united by our belonging to this land. And I go back and say, had Palestine not been stolen from us by the British, with the support of the French, with the support of President Woodrow Wilson at that time, and had Palestine not continued to be ignored by countries in the West, most definitely the United States and the United Kingdom, had the occupation and the apartheid and the colonization of our people in Palestine not been ongoing, we would not see what we are seeing today. I don't think we can separate the military authoritarian systems that we have in the region with, you know, from the occupation and colonization and apartheid of our beloved Palestine. You, you are exactly right, uh, Rania. I'm very happy that you mentioned that. Just so articulate that. with yes, the, the... It's all connected uh, yeah, somewhere. Yeah, ex exactly. Is this is all connected from the 100 years when, of when are we gonna messed stop? up I mean, the uh, Middle East. Well, when is it going to reverse, though? When is it going to... Because some people well, say, well, you keep I mean, blaming them. Something... It's happened so long ago. When, uh, you know, it's, are we... It's not long ago. It's not... Maybe for an American narrative, 100 years is a very long time. From our narrative, it's really not that long ago. I mean, a hundred years is several generations. And I look at these hundred years, and some people may say that most of our Palestine has been, um, you know, continues to be occupied, and our homes continue to be, de de to be demolished, and our children, our children continue to be detained by the Israeli occupation forces. But on the other hand, I see hope, because I see our people have continued to resist. I look at Lebanon, and I see that the resistance movement in Lebanon that began a long, long time ago had achieved victories that were considered to be impossible. All of Lebanese land, with the exception of the Sheba farms, have been liberated from Israeli military occupation. And we have also managed to stand strong in the face of Israeli aggression. And when we look within the, you know, the land of Palestine, which is all of it, min al bahr il al nahr all of it, we see that our people continue to, st continue to stand strong and continue to resist. A hundred years may be a very, very long time, yes, but it is a short time within the history of a people whose civilization goes back thousands of years. Before and I look also to what is happening in the United States with the growing boycott, divestment and sanctions movement that is 12 years, which is considered very young, and within these 12 years, the BDS movement has proven itself to be so strong in isolating Israel that laws have had to be passed in the United States to weaken it. That is evidence of its strength, not evidence of its weakness. So I am hopeful. I am hopeful that, yes, there will be a day when our land will be liberated. There will be a day when our land will once again be a home for people of different ethnicities and different religions and the apartheid system that is being imposed on Palestine, supported by every single U.S. administration, will also fall just as the political apartheid system in South Africa has fallen. Exactly, uh, Rania, because uh, imagine when there was uh, a hurricane in Texas, one of the stipulations for people to get uh, and apply uh, for economic aid from the government was uh, to sign a paper that says they will not do BDS. I mean, imagine, it is so powerful and it's spreading all over the world that now if there is a catastrophe here, has a, a, something to do with a hurricane and you want to get aid from the U.S. government in Texas, you have to sign a paper that says you will not do BDS, otherwise you will not you get will, Meaning you will not boycott you will not Israeli boycott. products or companies.
but actually what it means is that you are relinquishing your constitutional right as an American citizen to express an opinion that is protected within the Constitution. That's what it means. That we have right now U.S. politicians whose love for the apartheid system and the Zionist lobby within the United States makes them disagree and violate the constitution to which they have sworn an oath when they were elected as politicians. And that is why I am also sure that those laws that have been passed in several counties in Texas, and not by the entire state of Texas, will fall, as has already happened in two of those counties, because they are specifically unconstitutional. And here we see that the struggle within the United States against the apartheid system in Israel, the, the struggle within BDS is also a struggle for liberty within the United States. It's also a struggle to protect the constitutional rights of each and every American. Rania Masri is with us uh, live in Beirut. She is Arab, but she's also an American citizen. So I mean, you're, uh, for our listeners are listening and they're you know, hearing you talk about the Middle East and Beirut and talk about your identity as an Arab and in Lebanon and about Palestine, but you're also an American citizen and that's why you're also talking about the Constitution. You're so informed about it. Um, it's, uh, it was great having you on the program. Thank you so much for providing so much insight on what's happening in the Middle East. And uh, good luck. Uh, who knows what's going to happen over this weekend. Every weekend seems to be uh, full of surprises. Thank you. Thank you. But I have to say that we feel strong. We feel calm. We feel reassured. We have the protection of our people. And um, all that they can do is cause violence, which is all they know how to do, but they will not be able to transform or to break our backs. There's a, lot of rhetoric, there's a lot of rhetoric in America about that region. What can average American, what can our listeners do um, about what's happening there? Well, again, I would say if you're interested in supporting this region and supporting human rights, the first and most important thing that an American can do is support the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement. You can check their website, bdsmovement.net. You can also support Palestine Legal, which is a brilliant organization within the United States to support an American's legal right to express an opinion in support of Palestinian liberation. There's numerous ways for uh, people within the United States to become effective and constructive in supporting uh, our pathway for liberation and for freedom. And it begins with BDS. Thanks, Rania, for being on True Talk. Really appreciate it. Hope to see you soon, inshallah. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Thanks. Take care. That was uh, Rania Masri, live from Beirut. She's so uh, informed. A lot of things. That, you know, I thought she was a little bit too partisan on the, the side of the Lebanese again, especially, you know. Uh, She's actually uh, half Palestinian, half but Lebanese, um, uh, American. Uh, so, no, and I don't think she's a, a Shia. So not, it's, it's not about Shia, but yeah. I mean, like I have my, my, my concerns about Hezbollah and uh, Nasrallah, especially their role in Syria. It wasn't when she, when she was talking about the rebels being the so-called rebels. No, there were real rebels no, there. Some, some yes, of the people who were there were financed, you know, but... Some, some of them were ISIS, some of them were Jibhat and Nusra, which are, you know, that... Uh, used to be a lot that used to be aligned with Al Qaeda. All those groups are connected, but there were some real yeah, Syrian are, Lebanese people. Over. There were some, some some real uh, uh, Syrian Lebanese Lebanese soldiers started. that were, uh, yes. defected and, and formed the Free Syria Army. The Syria uh, uprising started as a peaceful protest and revolution calling. When the people from the outside started to Islamize the revolution, because in Egypt the Arab Spring was not an Islamic revolution. Right, everywhere it wasn't. Yeah, but when in Syria, outside forces On both sides. No. Iran sent their uh, fighters. From the beginning, it was. So uh, you're saying home, somebody else did it first? A home grown just like right. Egypt, just like Tunisia, just like Yemen, and then outside forces came in and turned it well, into an Islam. Before state. that, the government, in a, you know, the Bashar al-Assad brutal government, started cracking down and killing people. Still brutal and still there, and most of the people there had two choices: but whether the people, to continue but with Bashar. Let me finish. Whether to continue with the Bashar or continue with these Daesh Qaeda like people. No, it was. It, it was it wasn't Bashar that's what Bashar wanted. Bashar wanted it's either me or Al Qaeda. Well and, and and the same thing in Egypt. Sisi does the same thing, all these dictators do the same thing. They want to be the alternative to them is ISIS and these yeah, terrorist people groups. Are picking, unfortunately, of the, course, if you have a choice between these, you know, crazy ISIS or, you know, Saddam Hussein or some of these dictators, yes. So uh, that's what happened in Syria. No, but what 
but that's by design because the way that Bashar does that is they they, it's by design. they promote and they encourage that this ISIS groups and they provide the environment for them to grow where they eliminate the uh, the real opposition the mm -hmm. democratic forces the people that want to have democracy in the region and, and to have a future that are not like ISIS and they eliminate them and, and they strangle them out so then the, the only options available is between uh, you know the dictator and the ISIS groups so we're just saying the same thing now yeah, but... Uh, but you like to make it louder. No, it's not making it louder. <laughs> it's, it's Bashar. Because I We're not... scream. I need to learn to scream. No, you actually... You were actually... Say, you're saying the same thing. No, but what you're yeah, saying you're is that say. somehow that these ISIS groups were promoted by... Uh, let me think. Where are they getting all this money? Uh, who, I mean, uh, go ahead. Uh, where are they getting all this money? Yes, you're the one that's asking. Uh, you're no, no, you're no, providing. You're, I, I don't know. You're anyway, the one that's making the claim. Anything going on in town in Tampa? Let's change the mood here. No, I, the mood is fine. Yeah, I, somewhere it says that their, ISIS is getting money from somewhere, but she won't tell us. But now ISIS has been defeated. Oh, really? They, then they remove them out of so no, no, no. They uh, On Monday they are there, on Tuesday they are not there, and then on Wednesday they are there. Uh, so who are they working for? Uh, okay, I'm not going to say anything. If Summer has her own conspiracy theories. No. Um, so tell me... Uh, we have a call from Hatem in Tampa. Should we take it? Or do we have time? Is it really Hatem? Because uh, sometimes it's not who they are. Yeah. We also have Betty from Sarasota. Betty, we want to take the woman. Sorry, Hatem. Oh, well. Ladies first. Go with Betty. Betty, you're on True Talk. Go ahead. Yes, yes. Very interesting guest. Um, I thought she was um, really, obviously, like you said, well informed. Um, I do agree with you, Ahmed, in terms of uh, the Free Syrian Army. I did not agree fully with everything she had to say. Um, I loved her passion, but she seemed to be pro Nasrallah. And I think he's a force for evil, I really do. Um, and I'm not saying that as a Jewish person. Uh, I do not agree with a lot of Israel's policies. I think some of them are absolutely appalling and horrible and need to go goodbye, um, especially the whole settler movement. And um, I can fully understand the BDS movement, although I have to say there's, you know, everything that um, we do is always going to be fraught with contradiction because you know, it, it's also true that there are many Palestinians who are uh, Israeli citizens, also work and have their own firms, and many of them do have livelihoods that are completely uh, in, entangled with the Israeli culture and Israeli politics, but also Israeli economy. So in a sense, um, and you know, I do agree with the overall uh, essence of, of bringing down the occupation. I, I completely agree with that. But unfortunately, um, I've even heard Palestinians that have a friend, uh, Nazarene, who lives here, who's uh, from Syria, who understands also that, unfortunately, if you have a BDS movement, on some level, there will also be Palestinians who get impacted. So everything is so complex, so complicated, so fraught with that. That's what the viewers need to fully understand. And that, um, you know, I, I uh, just wanted people to know that everything that we say also has two sides, and Thank, that's really it. Thanks, Betty. <laughs> Levi and uh, Polk, temptation. What happened to Hatton? Hello, hi. Yeah, go ahead, Thank Levi. Yeah, man, I'm real grateful to hear that last guest. I definitely believe she, she was real. On the stage, the cause of the Israel is illegitimate. And Bashar al-Assad knows that. Why, in an interview in 2006 that he had with BBC, that's exactly what he stated. I just have a question out of like, how come he wasn't being mentioned before? This is Tyrant. Who? Bashar al-Assad, like 10 years ago. Yeah, well, maybe. He, he wasn't killing people, that's why. I mean, he was, he actually, there There was some hope because his father was also known as a, a tyrant and dictator and then this younger one that was educated in uh, Britain, um, there was some hope uh, that he would be more of a reformer, more open to 
uh, democratic reformation and uh, moving that way. He was kind of moving that way until this whole uprising actually, happened. Actually, he was doing uh, secret negotiations with uh, Israel, and he was very close to uh, reaching a settlement over the Golan Heights, which are Syrian territory and occupied. But again, uh, there is a power struggle in the uh, Middle East, as you know, probably, Levi, a bunch of dictators who want to have all dictators under their, you know, have one, uh, one theme, one uh, direction. But we are seeing with the younger generation, uh, for instance, in Qatar, in Syria, and uh, the Emirates and Saudi Arabia, when these younger generations came, they wanted... Uh, Some are right. Okay, so that's been True Talk on WMNF. We'll be back here same time, same